Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the fabulous Professor Griffin, um, uh, as well as to Eric for introducing us. Is it on? Shall I turn it on? Is it on now? Can you hear me now? Yes. And I can even move around, so much the better. Um, so thank you again, uh, Eric, for the, uh, for the introduction. It's an honor to be here at UVU and to appear with these really distinguished panelists. What I'd like to do uh, in my comments is to try to describe in conceptual terms the two leading schools of thought in the United States today about the relationship between religion and government and what the right relationship should be. And if what I say works, you might recognize yourself in one of these two schools, or you might find yourself in between, that's fine as well. I won't focus on the history of how these two schools arose. That's really uh, what Professor Balmer is gonna be speaking about, at least in, uh, with respect to the evangelical right. Nor will I go into any great depth about some of the contemporary challenges that are facing these two different approaches um, because Professors Turley and Renzi Renzi will be speaking about these, those issues directly as well. What I'm gonna try to do is give you a framework with which to address these kinds of questions. For purposes of introduction though, it's worth noting that the question of gay marriage, which the Supreme Court has just heard argument on, the question of a contraceptive mandate in Obamacare and the question of the rights of Catholic and other religious institutions within that legal framework. These are examples of contemporary issues that are deeply dividing Americans. I also want to say, uh, before I dive in, that in my view, the advocates of each of these approaches are deeply sincere and are well motivated by their own principles. So, my approach in describing these perspectives is to assume charitably, and in my view correctly, although you might uh, not think correctly, but I hope you'll at least think charitably, that the people who advocate these views really and truly believe in them and are not primarily motivated by bias or dislike of the other side. The reason I have to add that is that in this area of American public life, very often, People on either side say, well, of course, we're well motivated, but the other side are completely cynical. And because I am lucky enough to go and speak to groups on many different sides of these issues, but often to extremes on both sides, I'm accustomed to having people say this to me, and I know for a fact that the people on each side are totally sincere when they, in fact, say this. That is to say, um, people of one group are sincere when they say the others are insincere. So I'm willing to assume that inwardly they themselves are sincere. Although I guess we could be more cynical and reach a different interpretation. Okay, so what are these two groups? Let me start with the group that I think came into being longer ago. And that is the group whom I will call legal secularists. Now legal secularists don't necessarily have to be totally secular in their own personal beliefs and practices. They could actually be religious in their own beliefs and practices. What makes them legal secularists is that they believe that the proper approach for the law, the legal system of the United States, both the Constitution and our statutes, is for those laws not to take account of religion or religious difference, but to maintain secularity, that is to say non-religion, not necessarily anti-religion, but non-religion, Trade the baton. Thank you. Um, but non-religion in the public square. And particularly that the laws should help keep our system secular. So it's a two-part proposition. The laws should themselves be secular, and the laws should be used to keep the rest of the public square secular. On the other side, and I'll say a little bit more about their views in just a moment. On the other side are those whom I call values evangelicals. Now values evangelicals might be evangelical Christians, and in many cases they are, but they need not be evangelical Christians. It's sufficient for them to believe that the purpose of government is to take account of our values and to express our values, including our most deeply held religious values, 
throughout the society, including in the public square. So values evangelicals, as I'm describing them, believe that the government should stand for values, and they believe that the government should reflect the values of individual citizens, wherever those values come from. If those values come inwardly from religion for the individual voter, there's no reason, say the values evangelicals, that they shouldn't be expressed collectively by the public when it makes political decisions that grow out of our values. Now it's important to note, just as I noted, that the legal secularists are not necessarily anti-religious, that the values evangelicals are not against the establishment clause of the US Constitution. In the United States, values evangelicals typically do not believe that we should abolish the establishment clause. Or even, as many people believed in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, that we should amend the establishment clause to make us formally a Christian nation. Most values evangelicals don't believe that. They sincerely believe that it's good to have a country in which no individual religion is established. But they typically believe that if the government promotes policies that express religious values, that does not amount to a violation of the Establishment Clause. Now, one thing that these two groups that are deeply opposed have in common is that they each imagine that they are deeply under attack by the other, and they each imagine that they are in the minority and are about to be swamped by the people on the other side. Now, logically speaking, you might say they can't both be right, but that depends on your interpretation of how they got there. So let me describe the sense of embattled minoritarianism on the legal secularist side, and then I'll discuss it on the values evangelical side, and then I'll close by suggesting some possible avenues of compromise, some of which I think are not completely crazy, some of which are not crazy but utopian, and some of which are probably just crazy. <laughs> so let me start with the sense of being embattled. Legal secularists in the United States begin with the observation that in no other Western democracy on Earth is religion as important in the public sphere as it is in the United States. Despite the fact that we don't have an established religion, which Britain does, which even Denmark does, even Sweden, if you can believe it, has a national church of Sweden. In those countries, the established church takes care of you when you're born and you're usually baptized. It takes care of you the day you get married, although decreasingly so, because people get married in civil registry offices there too. And it takes care of you the day you die. And many, many, many people in let's say Denmark, to choose a representative example, are never in church in their lives except for those three occasions. <laughs> Politicians are openly atheist. By contrast, note the legal secularists, in the United States, it's still impossible to imagine at this late date a person being elected president if he or she said publicly that he or she flatly did not believe in God. Even to say I'm an agnostic, and some days I think maybe there's a God and some days I think not, probably wouldn't manage to get you elected in this country. Similarly, say the legal secularists, in the United States, religious organizations are rich, well-organized, take advantage of a unique tax status where they don't have to pay taxes either at the local or federal level, despite in many cases accruing vast empires of land uh, and other businesses. They influence politics. They lobby, despite rules that say they can't lobby on electoral issues from the pulpit. You can still talk about issues from the pulpit, and most mainstream religious denominations do so totally within the exercise of their constitutional rights. <laughs> Against this backdrop, say the legal secularists, they are the sole force standing up for the rights of dissenters, gadflies, 
people who live in a small town where everyone else gets up and simultaneously recites the Lord's Prayer at a Friday night football game, they're representing the one person in town who stands up and says, you're violating the Constitution when you do this. And so say the legal secularists, we are on the side of the little guy. We are on the side of the minority. We are the ones who are truly embattled. They add that no major national legislation could be passed, and they point to Obamacare, without significant opportunities being created in the statute and in the regulation that administers the statute for religious dissenters. Okay? So thus far, the position of the legal secularists. Last but not least, they point out that in polls consistently, Americans sound a lot more like values evangelicals than they sound like legal secularists. Now the values evangelicals. They feel disempowered too. They feel like minority figures as well. Why should that be the case? Well, most prominently they feel that beginning in the 1950s and then gathering steam in the 60s and 70s, the United States Supreme Court, in a series of decisions with which they deeply disagreed, banned first Bible reading from the public schools, then banned prayer from the public schools, then banned moment of silence from the public schools, has consistently, the courts have consistently banned the teaching of intelligent design curricula from the schools, to say nothing of creation science, which predated intelligent design. And in almost all of these circumstances, the Supreme Court used the same legal doctrine where they interpreted the Constitution to require that every law passed in the United States, whether by Congress or your local school board, have, quote, a secular purpose. And the consequence of this interpretation of the Establishment Clause, and this is an interpretation of what the Constitution says. The Constitution doesn't say anything about secular purpose. It says, no establishment of religion. The Supreme Court says, well, how do we know what that means? Well, it has several entailments, but one of the most important is every law must have a secular purpose. As a consequence of this, say values evangelicals, every time we want to enter the public square to advocate for a policy that we believe in because of our values, we are fighting with one arm tied behind our backs. And actually it's worse, it's two arms tied behind your back because if you're a values evangelical, you often cannot openly advocate for the real reason that you support a law. So let me just give you a very concrete recent example of this, but it's only the most recent, and that is gay marriage. The vast majority of polls show of Americans who oppose same-sex marriage oppose it on religious grounds. And yet, in none of the important cases in which courts have considered, and in many, many cases, struck down state bans on same-sex marriage, have values evangelicals been able to advance the argument that as a matter of religious tradition, the state should not recognize same-sex marriage? Why not? Because if you made that argument, and we've got some distinguished litigators uh, with us, so they'll affirm what I'm saying, if you made that argument, you'd lose the case right away. Because the court would say, well, you're giving a religious reason against same-sex marriage, and under our secular purpose doctrine, a law violates the Establishment Clause, if it doesn't have a secular purpose, and you're telling us right on the surface that you have a religious purpose. So that can't be a good enough reason to justify the law. As a result, those opposed to same-sex marriage have had to make a series of arguments framed non-religiously, which courts have mostly laughed at. I wish I could say the courts have been respectful to these arguments. The courts haven't been. Not only have they not upheld them, they haven't even been respectful of them. So the argument that same-sex marriage should be banned because marriage is about reproduction has been rejected by most courts that have engaged it, to give you one example. And there are other examples as well. The argument that same-sex marriage would undercut the nature of heterosexual marriage has also not been treated respectfully by the courts. And I would just suggest to you that the reason for this frustration and this sense of marginalization by values evangelicals is that it seems that somewhere along the way, the rules of the game were changed so that the legal secularists could make any argument they want in the public square, 
but values evangelicals couldn't make the arguments that are actually most central to their beliefs and values. So I think that's why values evangelicals, despite polls suggesting they have large numbers, despite the influence of the religious right in American politics, despite the fact that no American politician could openly uh, be dismissive or, or negative about their beliefs, nevertheless feel genuinely marginalized because they think that the legal secularists got control of the courts and changed the rules of the game to mandate secularism. So I take it that this is the political state of play and it's a political state of play that reflects particular kinds of constitutional arguments in our national life. So far the diagnosis, now let me say a few words about possible things that could be done to mitigate this. When I first started uh, writing about this, I was very influenced by the 2004 presidential campaign in which George W. Bush on the one hand and John Kerry on the other hand seemed almost exactly to represent the positions of the values evangelical and the legal secularist. Okay? This despite the fact that um, President Bush was not an especially church-going person. If you think about it, there were not pictures of him attending church. He did say that um, Jesus Christ was the most important philosopher uh, in his life when he was asked about in the debates about who the most important philosopher was. And there's no doubt that his religious faith played a role in his own personal life trajectory. But he wasn't openly affiliated in every, any very active way, even with the Methodist church that he occasionally attended. Yet he was clearly a values evangelical in that he believed that values ought to be informing the national political debate. John Kerry, meanwhile, uh, was a church-going Catholic who nevertheless had a whole series of views about politics that were totally at odds with the official views of the Catholic hierarchy, with the Catholic magisterium. He was a legal secularist of the classic sort, and you could hear this when, for example, asked about abortion rights, and he said, as a Catholic, I condemn abortion. But as a public figure, my view is that this is a question over which the laws should not impose a specific viewpoint. My view then and subsequently was that on both sides there was room to soften our national rhetoric so that legal secularists could draw upon religious language and religious discourse in an inclusive way in their public political speech and values evangelicals, for their part, could, when they thought about the question of individual religious liberty, extend that liberty away simply from religious people and to everybody who had a distinctive sense of conscience. Furthermore, I believed that values evangelicals, who in the 1980s and 90s were very interested to argue for greater state financial support for religious groups and organizations, school vouchers being the most obvious example, had room to compromise on this issue because they might realize that school voucher programs would not only fund their preferred religious institutions, but also those of religions they might not like very much. I would call these the reasonable parts of my hopes, and I say this with 2020 hindsight because actually in subsequent years, both of these things happened. When he ran for office in 2008, President Obama, whatever values evangelicals now think about him, was much more comfortable with talking about religion, was much more open in talking about religion, spoke in the cadences of a preacher when it served his political interests, um, and was generally much less anti-religious in his total cultural approach than John Kerry had been. And in those same years, the values evangelical movement, broadly speaking, largely abandoned the push for school vouchers. The Supreme Court held that vouchers were constitutional, which was a big victory, and lots of people, myself included, thought this might lead to many new school vouchers programs. It didn't. In fact, only a tiny number of school vouchers programs subsequently emerged. So I call those reasonable suggestions, and I say they're reasonable because they, in some sense, did ultimately come to pass. God only knows, not because I proposed them, but just because they were reasonable and politicians thought of them. Some perhaps less reasonable suggestions but nevertheless, I think within the realm of plausibility, would be for compromises on other major national issues that we're confronting that would take into account some of the interests of each side. So in the context of same-sex marriage, we were talking about this over lunch, one possible compromise, which I acknowledge is probably too late to achieve now, but one possible compromise 
was for the state no longer to use the word marriage to describe any union, but to describe every union as a civil union, and to leave the definition of marriage to every religious denomination on its own. This could have satisfied gay rights activists because it wouldn't have involved any discrimination, because everyone would be called civil union identified, and it could have satisfied, I think, many religiously motivated opponents of same-sex marriage because then the state wouldn't be calling anything marriage and your individual church could always do things the way it wanted. We can talk about this later. My sense is that the politics of this compromise have passed on both sides. I think it may be a shame that they've passed, but they have passed. In the sphere of the, let me conclude by saying the perhaps overly utopian, would be the suggestion that maybe and I'll be quiet after this, maybe, just maybe, we could get beyond our background assumption that people who have different views than we have are actually oppressing us, out to get us, and have put us on the run. It would be very good for legal secularists if they recognized that their entrenched position among educational elites, and therefore among the justices of the Supreme Court, gives them tremendous power and influence over the question of church and state in the United States. It would also, in my view, be helpful if values evangelicals would realize that their strong majoritarian position in the United States and the important cultural influence of their views means that they are also not an oppressed minority, not on the run, and that religious liberty is, in fact, strong and secure in the United States, stronger and more secure than it's ever been in any other country in the world, including the United States in previous eras. But as I said, uh, that is probably in the realm of the utopian and it's probably the place to stop. <laughs>